Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. We're a little down, so, uh, but we can worship the Lord just the same. A few things I wanted to uh, point out in the upcoming weeks. We've got, uh, obviously we've got Easter coming up pretty soon, so it's going to be a special week next week. But uh, if you're visiting with us today, we're glad that you chose us. And uh, if you would fill out one of those forms in the pew in front of you, that way we'd have a record of your visit. You can put it in the box underneath the sound booth, or you can just give it to one of us. <clears throat> we're glad you're here today. Ladies Retreat, March 23rd. You saw the sign up out there. If you've not done that yet, please do so. I think it's going to be an exciting time. It's going to be at Molly Allen's Ranch uh, on Ch Old Chapel Hill Road. <coughs> Resurrection Journey is coming up on Easter Sunday. There'll be more about that in just a few minutes. Blue Bonnet Ministry sign up. Our Blue Bonnets have come up this week, it looks like. It looks really good outside. And uh, if, you, if you have a chance, sign up for some of the time uh, to cover that area. It's been a good ministry for us. We have Good Friday service on, uh, on Good Friday at 6 p.m. And a sunrise service at the Methodist Church. If you've not been to that, it's really an, an, an awesome experience beautiful place over at the beside the Methodist Church and they serve us breakfast right afterwards so that makes it even better uh, let's see we have LaDonna I believe is coming up to tell us yes ma'am come right on up okay I didn't even have to turn around and look back when he said resurrection uh, journey on Easter and some of the adults were going what <laughs> because we're not doing it the way we've done it before and that that information is kind of for some of you adults that have helped the last two years uh, you're off the hook this year because we're going to do the resurrection journey Easter Sunday for our children and it's their going to be their Sunday school lesson um we're going to, um, you know, it would be great. Parents, especially, I'm going to talk to you. If, boy, the families could be here a little early and we could start at 945, it would be great. But no later than 955, okay? Because we've got to get the kids in costume and everything. And that's kind of where we're going with this, is the kids are going to be the characters this year. And they're going to act out at all the different stations and everything. Now, we're going to have it in some of the same rooms. And Dale and Jeff, thank you for working with us. They're going to kind of rearrange and meet with their classes someplace else so that we can have the parlor. It should not interrupt the, the adult Sunday school lesson or classes at all, um, except we are going to have the parlor. Dale's moving for us. And uh, so, let's see, what else am I forgetting? Um, kids are doing it in costume. The kids kind of got excited about that, so they invited grandparents. So par uh, grandparents, parents, you're welcome to come and walk along with us. We walk the different stations of the resurrection of, of, of Christ. And if, you know, if you as adults, you may not have a kid or a grandkid in there, if you want to come and walk with us and be a part of that, well, come on. You're, you're invited, and you're welcome to, to join us and everything. We will meet with the kids, or if you're wanting to walk that, we'll meet with the kids in the foyer right by the front door. That's where they're going to go find the donkey and get started. And so it's a hands-on. There's a lot of activities for the kids. It's fun to watch, if nothing else. Those adults that have volunteered the last couple of years or so, um, Come and join us. Watch what happens and all the rest of it that you didn't get to see. <laughs> so I think that's it. Easter Sunday, Resurrection Journey, hands-on for kids. You're invited. So come and join us if you want. But your Sunday school class will be going on as well. Okay, one last thing is the Annie Armstrong uh, offering is going on through Easter, and I believe we have a video for that.
Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day, with this beautiful day, and we thank you for the upcoming Easter season. Uh, Lord, help us to be uh, missionaries for you here in Chapel Hill and all around. Uh, Lord, just let us uh, be with Mike as he delivers the message today, and uh, help us to take it to heart. In Jesus' name, amen. And when he said Brother Mike, yes, Brother Mike is here today. Not our Brother Mike, but Brother Mike, not the other Brother Mike. <laughs> We're glad you're here today. Let's stand together and sing. He keeps me singing. Does he really keep you singing this morning?
be seated. Scripture reading today is out of 2 Corinthians 5, 11 through 21. I don't know if it's going to be on the screen or not. If not, follow along in your Bibles. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade men. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your, rec- to your conscience. We're not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what, it, what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, it is for the sake of God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore, therefore all died. And he died for all. And those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So, from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come, and this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Once again, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. We ask you to be with us the rest of this service, that you would speak to us and speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together again as we sing, Lord, I lift your name on high. Like the fragrance I 
Father God, blessed be your name. Lord, just open our eyes, Lord, that we can see you all around us. And help us, Lord, that others, that we can help others open their eyes, Lord. They can see you and see the blessings that you give us each day. 
Lord, we thank you uh, for Brother Mike as he as he leads the the sermon today. That he brings that sermon to Lord, Lord, us, Lord. We just ask that you lift him up. Let us hear what he has to say, Lord. Let us put it in our hearts, put it in our minds, Lord, that we go from here, that we can tell others about Christ. Lord, we just ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. It's all yours. <laughs> okay, thank you. It is good to see you this morning. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapters 30 and 31. Uh, as you're going there, I just want to first of all say thank you for letting me come back for seconds. I appreciate it. It's good to be here. Uh, I recognize some of your faces now, and thank you for smiling back at me. I appreciate that. I always do good with a good smile, so thank you. The second thing is thank Mike for allowing me to be here. I know that he is with his family today and in, in, uh, observing the baptism of his grandson. So uh, praise the Lord for what God is doing in their lives. So pray for them as they're away. They'll be back next Sunday. And third, I just want to thank you for your gifts to the Annie Armstrong Mission Offering. I have some friends who are this morning in Chelsea, Vermont. Uh, they are home missions and being supported by the Annie Armstrong Mission Offering. And as I personally give, I know that some of the money that I give is going to go to them to help them with their ministry as they serve this little community, the only presence in Chelsea, Vermont of God's Word. And Vermont happens to be a state where 97% of the people, 97% of the people, it's not that they don't believe in God, they have no use for God. So 3% is what is being reached in Vermont right now. And so we need to pray for them, pray for those who are serving us while we are not there, but they're serving us and serving the Lord and sharing the gospel. I always love this picture, and just picture in your mind with me. If you want to close your eyes and look at it, you've seen it. But you've seen this father walking along the path, and this little child. I saw a little child over here. That was so neat. This little child walking with dad or granddad, and the child keeps wanting to reach up and grab and just hold on, and, and the dad has his finger holding down, and, and, the, and the little kid keeps trying to reach for it, and they finally make contact. I love that picture because that, in my mind, is exactly how we are when we want to reach to God, and God always has his hand down wanting to take us. But it's our responsibility to reach up to him to take it. It's always there. Two years ago, I was with my family. We had planned a trip to go to Valcita Lake, which is right outside of Durango, Colorado. When my boys were little, we went there several times on camping trips, and we would camp, and, and there was a beautiful place. This was before the fire, so there were trees. When the fire came, all the trees were wiped out. But there were, were, there were places where you could park your camper trailer and, and you could visit with people that were around you and hummingbirds all over the place. It was a beautiful, beautiful scene. Two years ago, we went back to reenact some of that with our grandkids and, and my kids, my two sons, my two daughters in love, my five grandchildren. And we had a wonderful time while we were there. We rented one afternoon, or one day actually, a pontoon so we could go out on Visita Lake and we could enjoy the scenes. We went from this area to this area, went up to the dam, looked at it. We walked all the way around, tried to do everything we possibly could, and, and we're on the boat. So that was the morning, and then we went back, we had lunch, then came back and the two boys and myself got back on the pontoon and we went around the lake and we found some places where we could fish that was what we were going to do just to be alone and for those fishermen who are here you know how it is whether they're biting or not you just enjoy it there's something about being with your boys that I really enjoyed it I was wearing a cap. It was a special cap. It was one given to me by my father-in-law who happened to be a rancher, raised Charlay. So it had D&J on there, and, and uh, the wind got up a little bit, and somehow my, my cap just seemed to fly away. It, it wasn't that the water was all over the place. It was just a, a gust, and it, the next thing you know, my cap was gone. My younger son thought, well... That's no problem. So he took his shirt off. He just jumped right into the water, started to swim to it. And I thought, Sean, that's okay. It's just a cap. 
even though in my heart it was a special cap. And as he started, he grabbed it, and then he started coming back to the pontoon. And for those of you who have been out around the water, you know how sometimes these currents or these undertows, they, they come out of nowhere. You don't see them. You don't know where they are, but they show up. And I sat there and watched my son struggling, swimming, trying to get back to the pontoon. And in doing so, he was getting further away. And he finally called out and says, Dad, help me. I can't. And he's, he's a great swimmer. Both of my boys are excellent swimmers. But he says, Dad, I can't. Something's keeping me. Dad, come. Help. Help. So I had to pull the, the anchor start the pontoon and go toward him and and i reached out to grab him and pull him back inside and when he got inside all i did was just hug him because in that moment i saw the fear in his eye i saw what what could have been a tragedy if i'd have just sat there and watched because the more he tried to come to me the more he was drifting away in our own lives there are times when we have tragedy that comes. There, there may be problems within our own marriages where it seems to be drifting apart. Maybe our children where we have seen them at one time where they were, where they were thriving and wanting to grow in the Lord, and now they've, they've turned away and they've drifted away to where they're not there anymore. And your heart reaches out and wants to say, come, come back, come home. And yet they drift. It could be that one day you were financially stable and now you're suffering. You're, you're having these struggles in your own financial needs. To where you say, I don't know where the next meal will come from. I don't know about my finances. I don't know what was going to happen. And it causes struggles not only with your marriage but with your children. The kids don't understand. Dad, you still have checks. (laughs) You still have a credit card. But you and your heart know that I can't do that. There are churches that are struggling today. There are internal strife going on that the more that we try to reach to God and say, God, please help us, we wonder, where is God? Some of you have seen the movie. I watched it again this last week of God's Not Dead, where the young man in the class finally asked the professor, he says, why are you so mad at a God that you don't believe in? Sometimes we question God. We do. We say, God, where are you in the midst of all that's going on? Do you understand? I've followed you so many years. I've done all these things for you. I've done exactly what you've told me to do, but yet you still don't seem to show up, God. Do you really care? Jeremiah the prophet heard these cries from the people. You see, they had been in captivity They had been in bondage. They had been tormented. Uh, It was because of their sins, which is another point. Sometimes we, we do it ourselves and then blame God to not get us out of it. God, why are you letting me go through this? Well, did you put yourself there to begin with? Well, well, I may have had something to do with it. But the truth is, God wants to help you. I heard it in the message this morning. God God sometimes gives you comfort. He sometimes gives you those comforting words. But he sometimes wants to confront you. The prophet Jeremiah comes to the people in a time of confrontation. And he says, I want you to understand where God is in all of this. In Jeremiah, we hear this Jeremiah in chapter 1. You see the story where Jeremiah is, is brought, God brings him to him, and, and, and Jeremiah starts using these excuses. I, I, I can't talk so good. I'm just a youth. I, I've heard messages on that where, where pastors have talked about Jeremiah saying, I'm just a kid. God can't use me. I'm just a kid. And then we read, even as I heard in the message this morning, it, it at my church 
Josiah, eight years old. What if your eight-year-old came to you today and said, God says we need to do this. God says we need to change this. Jeremiah is just a youth. Now, he grows, and God uses him. But the, the sad part about Jeremiah is, let me put it this way. A friend of mine who used to be my interim pastor, used to be my friend. He's, he's still my friend. Don't misunderstand me. But he, he used to pastor in a church where there was this one man in the church who was always negative about everything. There, there was not one good positive thing that came out of his mouth. And he finally just felt like saying one day, whenever it was time to have this prayer during the worship service, he said, Brother George, would you just lead us in a word of discouragement this morning? <laughs> Are we that way? <laughs> Jeremiah was that guy. He didn't have one good thing to say because God was telling him, tell the people, tell the people, give them this discouragement because where they are, I am not pleased with. And then we get to chapters 30 and 31 where it's as if he's writing this book of comfort. He's writing these words to say, I want you to understand God is for you, not against you. God is here to help you. And he writes these words in Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 1 through 3. He says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Write all the words which I have spoken to you in a book. For behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people in Israel and Judah. The Lord says, I will also bring them back to the land that I gave to their forefathers, and they shall possess it. Move down to verse 8. It shall come to pass on, come about on that day, declares the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off their neck and will tear off their bonds, and strangers will no longer make them their slaves. But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. De Jeremiah gave these words. But he, he died before he had an opportunity to see these words come to pass. But as he gave these words, he was saying, people, listen. Even though you're going through all of this, even though you're suffering trials and tribulations and troubles of all kinds, just remember God knows, God cares, and God will bring you back home. There are a lot of promises that he gives through all of this. I just want to share three this morning. The, the hope that we can find in God, in Jesus Christ. The first one is that there's hope with an everlasting love. Has there ever been a time where you thought that God did not love you? I want to give you a truth this morning, and if you want to say it to yourselves, say it. God has is and always will love me let me say it again god has is and will always love me even when you do bad and even when you blow it there's never a time where god will say I i'm fed up with you i'm tired of you i don't love you anymore that would be just like saying Jesus Christ went to the cross, he died, and as his blood was being shed, he says, I'm giving this side over here, my blood. All of you, you don't get any. What kind of God is that? What kind of Jesus is that? My Bible says, Scripture says that when Jesus shed his blood, his blood was shed for all, for all sins, for all people. What kind of love is that? That's an everlasting love. Look at that again. The Lord appeared to him. This is Jeremiah 33, verse 3. The Lord appeared to him from afar. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. There is an everlasting love that will never die out. It's better than the Energizer 
Energizer bunny? Yeah. You know, you see that. You see that that bunny just keeps going and going and going. God's loving kindness will never, ever, ever, ever run out. He loved you before you were born. He loves you now in the midst of whatever you're going through, and he will love you all the way through it. He says, I have drawn you with loving kindness. Some may say, if God really loves me, why is he letting me go through this? There's tough love. It doesn't mean that he doesn't care for you. It doesn't mean that when you do bad that you're not going to have to suffer the consequences. We think that if I ask for forgiveness, God is going to forgive me of my sins, which he will. He'll, he'll forget all of my sins, which he will. And he won't make me suffer the consequences, which he won't. I have a good friend who is in East Texas, run, is, is the camp manager. I'll never forget when I, when I first met him, became good friends just right off the bat. He's a good woodsman. He, he loves to work with wood, build things. He's very cautious around equipment until the one day when the saw took off this and he lost his fingers. You know, he's sorry that he did that. He knew better. He, he's a good word worker. He, he knows how to work with wood. He knows about the equipment. He knows safety. But it was in that one moment that, that he lost his fingers. If he asked God for forgiveness for what he did, surely his fingers ought to grow back. No. To this day, he's still without those fingers. Did God love him any less? No. Did God allow that to happen? You know, we can argue that. God didn't make it happen. It, it was an accident. It happened. But God knew it. But it didn't stop him from his ministry. To this very day, he still serves the Lord. He still works with wood. He still serves others. God loves us, loves us with an everlasting love. He says, I'm sending these circumstances into your life to draw you back into this loving kindness. I want you to know that you are worth a lot to me. God loves you. In Luke chapter 15, verse 20, we read the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son goes to his dad and he says, Dad, I want all of my stuff and, and I want it now and I, I want to go. I just want to go do my own thing. And, and the father let him do it. And over a period of time, he realized what he had done. And we can go through all of the sins that he had committed. But when he got down to it, he realized, I really had it better in my father's house. I love what happens next. He goes home. With the attitude of, if I could just be a servant, if my dad will just let me be a servant, I'll be happy to be a servant. But according to this passage of the prodigal son in Luke, it says the father saw him. He ran to him. He embraced him. And he welcomed him home. No matter what you've gone through, no matter what your circumstances are, no matter about your family or your finances or your children, God loves every one of you today with an everlasting love. And no matter how far you think you are, God still has his hand out. And all we have to do is reach and take it and say, Father, please take me back. Forgive me with an everlasting love. Another thing that Jeremiah comes to him and says, these people, and he says, I want you to know that God is going to rebuild what has happened. I want you to have the hope that he's going to rebuild your life. He's going to rebuild your marriage. He's going to rebuild everything if you will allow him to. If you can remember the story of, of how God used 
Jeremiah to tell the people. And, and again, Jeremiah was not alive when this came to pass. But listen to what he says in Jeremiah 31, verse 4. He says, again, I will build you and you will be rebuilt. O virgin of Israel, again you will take up your tambourines and go forth to the dances of the merrymakers. Again you will plant vineyards on the hills of Samaria. The planters will plant and will enjoy them. I will rebuild your city. I will rebuild your walls. I will re rebuild your families. Just a little history lesson here. In, in Jeremiah's time, they are under Babylonian captivity. In, in 605 B.C., even before that, there was this struggle. The, the Assyrians had come in, and they had sort of taken over the Egyptians, and then the Egyptians and the Assyrians joined together. And then in, in 605, the Babylonians came, and they overtook the Assyrians and the Egyptians. In fact, there was this big battle, the Battle of Car Carchemish, that, that the Pharaoh Necho and, and Nebuchadnezzar got into the battle, and, of course, Nebuchadnezzar was taking over everybody. And every time that he would go into this, this area, he would take their king. He had something he called trophies in his palace, in Nebuchadnezzar's big palace. He had these, these little apartment areas where you would think that they would take in prisoners and they would put them into bondage. Well, he didn't do that with these kings of these smaller towns, these smaller countries. He would take them over and he would take the kings and put them in these little apartments and then he would hold a big banquet and he would bring all of these kings out and it was like my trophies. Because as he would point to each of these kings, he would say, I own this kingdom. I own this kingdom. I own this kingdom. I own this kingdom. And, and they saw all of these kingdoms that Nebuchadnezzar had. The king of Judah at that time was Jehoiakim. And he came and Nebuchadnezzar took him and brought him in. And Zedekiah was placed in the place of Jehoiachin. Excuse me, Jehoiachin. There, there were two of them. Jehoiachin. And, and Zedekiah was brought in and put into the place in Judah to take care of the people. Well, after several years... Zedekiah realized, I'm tired of paying taxes to Nebuchadnezzar. We're just not gonna, we're just gonna keep the money to ourselves. Nebuchadnezzar got the word. And he went and in four, excuse me, 587 BC, he finally said, That's enough of that. If you're not gonna pay the taxes, I'm gonna come in and annihilate. Listen to these words from 2 Kings chapter 25. He says, now in the ninth year of his reign, on the tenth day of the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came, he and all his army against Jerusalem, camped against it and built a siege wall around it. So the city was under siege until the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. On the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine was so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. Then the city was broken in two. And the men of war fled by night by way of the gate between the two walls beside the king's garden. Though the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, were all around the city, and they went by way of Araba. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho, and all his army was scattered from him. Then they captured the king and brought him to king of Babylon in Riblah. And he passed sentence on him, and they slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, then put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him with bronze fetters and brought him back to Babylon. Now on the seventh day of the fifth month, which was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and listened to this. He burned the house of the Lord. He burned the king's house, the house that David had built, the temple that Solomon had built. He burned all of the houses of Jerusalem, and every great house he burned with fire. So the army of the Chaldeans, who were with the captain of the guard, broke down the walls around Jerusalem. 
and Jerusalem was torn down. Jerusalem was a waste. And Jeremiah comes to the people and says, you know what has happened. But there will be a day when God will rebuild the walls. He will rebuild the city. He will rebuild the town. And he will rebuild the people. There were a lot of the people that had to die off before they could go back and witness all of this. And for those of you who remember, it was 70 years of Babylonian captivity that they had to suffer under Nebuchadnezzar. And Jeremiah comes and he says, I want you to know that God is going to rebuild. God is going to do this, and you will get to see the hand of God at work. Psalm 30, verse 5, it says, For his anger is but for a moment, but his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may last for a night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning. There's going to be a shout of joy that's going to happen through this. It says that he burned everything. He tore everything down. But just remember, there's going to be joy that will come at some time. I love the passage, and I've used it many times from Jeremiah 29, 11. God says, I have a plan for you, not to harm you, not to bring calamity on you, to, but to bring you a hope and a future. Then you will call upon me. Whatever's going in your life right now, God wants to rebuild. He wants to, to take care of you and to rebuild whatever is broken down. So we find out that he loves us with an everlasting love. He's going to rebuild, but the final thing he's, he, he will restore. In chapter 31, verse 4, it says, Again, I will build you, and you will be rebuilt, O virgin of Israel. Again, you will take up the tambourines and go forth to the dances of the merrymakers. Now, just picture in your mind, when was the last time you went to a funeral, and you went to the cemetery, and everybody got out their tambourines and started shaking their tambourines and dancing around the gravesite? <laughs> that's, just, that's just not right. I mean, and who would ever think of something like that? But Jeremiah is coming in and he says, I'm going to restore the heart of God back to the people, God says. I'm going to restore you. I'm going to bring you back. I want you to know that I love you. And we still look for a time where God is going to bring that joy back to us. I remember David as he was caught in sin with Bathsheba, killed Uriah the Hittite. He did everything that you could possibly think of, and it was premeditated. He had it in his heart that he was going to do it. And yet when he was confronted about his sin, he grieved and he mourned. And it's recorded in Psalm 51 where he prays that prayer, Restore unto me. Restore unto me. He, he, he says these words, Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, but restore unto me the joy of your salvation. It wasn't that he lost his salvation. You can never lose your salvation for those who know Jesus Christ. There's nothing that you can do that can keep you from being the Father's child. But you can lose your joy. You can, you can wander away. You can drift away. You can live like you want to and think, I've got it made, and then realize you're in the pits, just as the prodigal son realized. And when you're in that lowest, lowest place, and the only place you can look up, look up and say, God, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Do you remember when you accepted Jesus Christ? Do you remember the joy that you had? I don't remember if I shared it the last time that I was here, but when I accepted Jesus Christ, I, I was so scared. I sat in the middle row. The invitation came. I was so scared. I, I, I didn't even go forward. The church service was over. The invitation was over. I went back, and the pastor was back there, and and I was just crying, and, I, and, and he said, Mike, what's wrong? And I said, I want to be saved. 
And I'll never forget, he turned to the people who were still there and he says, would you just please pause and pray for this young boy while I go talk to him about accepting Jesus Christ? We went back to his office right then. We didn't, we didn't make up an appointment for the week. He took me right then. And we went into his office and he shared with me about Jesus Christ's love and the joy and the peace of accepting him. And I'll never forget praying the prayer, asking Jesus into my heart. This peace just came all over me. But you know what the exciting thing was? When we walked out of his office, the people were still there. Are we so much of a hurry to get out of here that we fail to say, if there's someone that needs to know Jesus Christ, can we just stop and pray right now? It's more important to have the joy of salvation and to see one more come to Jesus Christ. Pray, pray. And David says, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Restore to me the joy that I once had. John chapter 10, verse 27, it says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my Father's hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Jeremiah brings these words to this people, this, this book of comfort. He says, even though you're going to go through all of this trouble, all of these trials, all of this stuff, just remember, God cares for you. God is going to, to come to you with an everlasting love. He's going to rebuild what you have broken down. He's going to restore the joy of that fellowship with him, the joy of that salvation. Come, all you who are weary, Jesus says, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. That's where we are today. Remember the, the picture of the grandfather with his hand down and the little child reaching up? That may be where you are today. Yeah, I had to look. I scared. <laughs> that may be where you are today. That God is wanting to reach down to you. He has been for quite a while. And yet because of whatever, you're not wanting to reach up. If you want to know what peace is really all about, if you want peace in your own heart, Hold to God's unchanging hand. His hand is always there ready for you. All you have to do is reach up and take him by the hand and say, here am I. There may be someone here this morning who has never accepted Jesus Christ. That's the first step. Just reach out and take it. I cannot promise you that if you accept Jesus Christ, everything is going to be okay. Your finances are going to be good. Your marriage is going to be wonderful. You're going to have the best job. I'm not going to make you that promise. In fact, truthfully, if you accept Jesus Christ, the worst is yet to come in some ways. The old friends you used to run around with, you can't run around with anymore. The old habits that you used to have, you don't want them anymore because God is going to do a change in you. Now, you may say, well, I've got to clean up some things before I can come to him. Here's the truth. I never remember ever taking a shower before I went fishing. <laughs> Think of that. I, I, I don't want to get cleaned up and say, God, if I get cleaned up, then I can come to you. I go to Jesus and allow him to clean me up from the inside out. So if you never accepted Jesus Christ, today is the day.
to do that. If you know Jesus Christ is Lord and your Savior, but you're going through some troublesome times, the altar is open for you just to, just to pray. Yeah, you can pray anywhere. I know that. But sometimes you just need to come and you need to say, God, I've drifted. I'm drifted and I can't get back in the boat. And no matter how, how hard I swim, I'm not getting there. Come help me, Lord. And when you finally get into that boat, into the arms of Jesus, you can say, God, thank you for restoring that joy to me. I want to close with a song, and I think the words will be up there, but just listen to these words. God's unchanging hand. It's actually, I don't know about tomorrow. I don't know about tomorrow. I just live from day to day. I don't borrow from its sunshine, for its skies may turn to gray. I don't worry o'er the future, for I know what Jesus said. And today I'll walk beside him, for he knows what is ahead. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand. But I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. I don't know about tomorrow, it may bring me poverty. But the one who feeds the sparrow is the one who stands by me. And the path that be my portion may be through the flame or flood, but his presence goes before me, and I'm covered with his blood. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. Father, as we come to a time where we, we call it our time of invitation, Lord, it, to invite those who have never accepted you to come today. We invite those who need to come and just to make it right with you, to say, God, I've wandered away. I've, I've turned from your ways, Lord, and I just want to come home. Lord, your arms are always open. And for us, Lord, we want to open arms also. Forgive us for the times where we've passed judgment. Forgive us for pointing fingers. Forgive us, Lord, for accusing. When God, truthfully, I'm a sinner also. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive us. Restore the joy of your salvation. Because, Lord, I know you hold my hand. And I praise you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand. We're going to sing. I'll be here in the front. If you have anything you want to talk about, about your needs or whatever, you come and talk to me. If you want to come and pray, do so. This is your time now to respond. Come just as you are, hear the Spirit call, come just as you are, come and see.
Thank you, Brother Mike, for bringing us that word. God doesn't hate us, does he? God loves us. I'm going to ask Brother Reynolds, would you dismiss us in prayer or lead us in a closing prayer and we'll be dismissed with family of God, okay? Been washed in the fountain. 